Let's talk about pricing items in free-to-play games. I am your host, Javier Barnes. I'm Senior Product Manager here at Tilting Point. I also write about game design economy at my blog, and I have more than 10 years of experience in game economy design. I've worked at several companies, including Gameloft and Social Point. And I also have done wrestling, but we are not here to talk about wrestling. We're going to talk about how to set item prices on free-to-play games. Now, most of the content that you're going to find on the internet related to prices is related to offers and discounts, which makes complete sense because offers and discounts is a simpler topic. And on top of that is the action that will bring you uh, the most money because it affects to the value of the in-game currency, so it changes the value of all the prices in the game at the same time. Now, the problem is that offers and discount work on top of a pre-existing price model. And this kind of price model, or how to generate it, is a bit of a black box right now. Hopefully, this presentation will change that, or at least it will kick off uh, the conversation on how to do that. Now, before we start, I want to introduce you to a couple of basic concepts. One of them is the fact that if there are prices, it means that there are purchases. Now, a purchase has two main factors. It has one factor related to desire, so how much the customer wants the product, and it has another factor related to the affordability of the product price or to the price itself. When those uh, bubbles intersect, that's when a purchase happens. Now, on the topic of desire, there are several factors like how much does the customer want the game? Uh, how much fun is it, is it experiencing? How much the item will increase that fun and so on. But on the topic of the price, um, there's also several factors, including how easy it is to find the cheaper replacement, the sense of opportunity, uh, if, it, if it's something that uh, will save me money eventually, and the most important of, of them all is the actual price of the item. So if uh, this can of a slurm, if uh, the price is uh, small, then it means the affordability uh, will be very big. So it will intersect with uh, bubbles of desire that are smaller. And if the price is very high, then the affordability bubble will be smaller. So it will only be bought by those players that really have a strong desire for it. Now, how much the demand is influenced by the price. That's something that we call the price elasticity of demand. You probably have heard about it as just price elasticity. Uh, now this is, okay, if we modify the price, how many sales, how much the demand is gonna decrease, right? And of course, uh, how this looks is if the price is smaller, then you're gonna make a lot of sales. If the price is high, uh, then you're not gonna make a lot of sales. You're gonna make less, less of them, right? Now, one of the things that is interesting about this is the fact that the price elasticity of demand curve is not linear, it's not a straight line, it's kind of a bend. Uh, what this means is that small changes, small variations on the price of uh, small priced items is going to generate a lot of effect on the demand. Uh, so we say it's an area of the curve that is very elastic, while changes on the high end of the uh, spectrum is not going to generate a lot of changes on demand. So we say that those prices are an elastic, which makes complete sense if you relate it uh, to real world economy, right? If um, you put a coffee, you multiply by 10 uh, the price of, uh, of a coffee, uh, then you're going to lose a lot of, of um, people buying it. But if you probably, if you round up the cost of a supercar, uh, you're more or less going to be, like that content is going to be bought by more or less the same amount of people. Now, what this means, the fact that the line is not, is not a straight line, but rather it's a curve, it means that uh, not every single point of the line, not every single price is going to generate you the same amount of revenue. If it was a straight line, uh, then if you would increase the price by $1, then you would lose $1 worth of demand. But this is not what happens in reality, right? Because it's a curve. So this means that every single price or every single item has an op optimal price point, a point where uh, the amount of increase in the price uh, decreases a demand to such a degree that you are making the most revenue. Now, does this mean that every single price in a game has to be on the optimal price point? 
course not. First, because not every single price that you generate on the game uh, aims to generate revenue directly. Some of them, they just want to provide uh, objectives for the players so that they keep on playing, they keep on grinding. Some others, they just want to convert people, to make people make the first purchase. And at that, at that stage, you don't want to uh, make the most money out of it. You just want to make any money because you want players to make their first purchase in the game. And the second is that there's not a single optimal price point for an item because your game will have different types of audiences and each type of audience will have different income and we have different optimal price. So just with two, these two concepts, we already have a lot of questions uh, for in-game pricing. Uh, questions like, okay, what buyer audiences do you have in the game? What's the optimal price point for each of them? How much content should be dedicated to each? How much free content should be there? Uh, and this is where this presentation comes in. Uh, we're going to teach you a methodology that we have created for uh, this event. Now, before we start, um, let me go over certain disclaimers. First is that this is not the best methodology. The best methodology is adapted to each game. But we think this is something that is pretty solid and we can teach you in 20 minutes. It's going to be a sneak peek about uh, how to create prices in games, uh, but we won't go too much into detail in each of the points. Uh, the second is that the model is based primarily on systems based on permanence. The third is that, as, as I said, this is going to be a sneak peek. Uh, we won't deal with advanced concepts related to behavioral economics, uh, building control models, and so on. That things, those things, you will have to discover them on your own. And the last thing is that it won't work with player-driven economies because in those economies, you don't create, uh, you don't set up the prices directly, but rather you have to act on other elements that which then will make the market create those prices. So let's start with this five-step methodology. The first step is going to be about researching competitor prices and researching and learning the spending habits of your audience. The second is going to be uh, establishing an equivalence between the different re game resources, fiat money, and the acquisition time. Uh, the third is going to be structure the items uh, from less valuable to more valuable and structure them in a way that doesn't make the price increase uh, at the turn. And the last step is going to be to assign the prices based on everything else above. There's a fifth step, which is kind of a trick because it's a series of special considerations that you need to take in account at every uh, step of the way. Let's go one by one uh, over uh, them all. The first is research uh, competitor prices and audience. And what kind of things will you be interested on in benchmarking? Now, when it comes to competitor pricing, uh, stuff that you need to or you want to know is the distribution of their prices over their different price points, how much of those items are separated over their different currencies, so how much of them are premium, they are priced on hard currency, how much of them they're priced in soft currency, so they are uh, achievable without paying, at least in theory. And also you want to research the resource acquisition speed uh, to be able to know, okay, um, even if you don't pay for something in money, uh, if you pay it on time, how much time are we talking about? And about the audience purchasing habits, you are interested in knowing uh, which, kind, which, which profiles of players uh, exist in, in the game, uh, what's the amount that they will spend regularly, uh, how often would they spend, and basically the weight that each of them have over the game revenue as a whole. So uh, just by doing this research, you're going to find a lot of things related to the game design and how the systems design, how the game design of a game heavily impacts uh, the price. One example is Real Racing 3. If we compare Real Racing 3 and CSR 2, one of the things that we will notice is that cars in both games, they have a significant difference uh, in price. Uh, the most expensive car in Real Racing 3, it's above $100. Uh, and in CSR 2, it's a fraction of that. Um, now, this does not mean that CSR 2 
uh, is a cheaper game. What it means is that uh, the upgrade system in CSR2 has, has much more depth because it has um, items that you need to collect. It has a wide range of uh, upgrades that you need to manage and everything. So it means that both games will generate the same amount of money, but one of them can give you the car essentially for free or at the cheaper price. And then you have to spend much more to keep it up and to be able to max it out. Um, this, of course, is a big advantage for CSR2 because in car games, one of the best things is to be able to buy new cars and to be able to have this kind of powerful, uh, the best car ever. And CSR2 is able to provide it at a cheaper price. Now, if we were working on a racing game, let's imagine we would compare uh, different, the different uh, sets of prices of different games. And for example, we could generate two main spending personas. One would be uh, Mr. Subaru, which would be a meat spender. He would spend like about $20 per month, passionate about car tuning. And then we have uh, Mr. Porsche, which is a heavy spender. It's a guy that spends $100 per month and basically likes supercars. And then out of those personas, we will complete it with more details, like how much do they do they play uh, um, every day and so on. And we would use that information to guide us later onto the price creation process. The second thing uh, that we want to do is to set up an equivalence between the different game resources, uh, fiat with real money and, and time. Now, why would we want to do that is because everything in free-to-play games is payable either with money or with time. One important distinction that we have to uh, take into account here is the fact that time can be playing time, so time that you actually spend on playing the game, or it can be waiting time, like for example on strategy games, where basically the game is collecting resources for you while you're doing something else. And that's an important consideration because the um, amount of time that you're going to demand from the player is going to be completely different if it's time that the player has to spend on the actual game or if it's time that the player just have to wait. Now, two things to consider on uh, when creating these equivalences are first the IAP pack volume discount, which means that in most free-to-play games, uh, if you buy a smaller pack, so if you spend um, if you just buy the $1 pack, you're gonna get, get a certain amount, but if you get the most expensive uh, packs or more, more expensive packs, you're gonna the price, the unit price of each gold unit uh, or each currency unit is gonna get cheaper. Um, this is the IAP pack volume discount. Now, some tips to how to deal with that is you could simply average all unitary prices. And this is especially works if the max discount is not too big. Um, or you can create, uh, you can select the one that is the most representative. The second is currency inflation, uh, especially with soft currency. Most games uh, kind of increase the amount of currency that the player uh, gets per minute as the game progresses, and that generates inflation in that currency. It means that each unit of uh, that um, currency uh, costs less when it comes to time. Uh, tips here, well, the best one would be try to design the economy so that it doesn't generate inflation or it generates very little inflation or uh, create two, three-year scenarios of different moments of the time um, that you, you then will, will use. Like this kind of three scenarios, like, okay, how much uh, does a player collect per minute on early game, mid game, and late game, for example. In our example, remember this car game that we are building, uh, we have a game where time gives you fuel. Fuel allows you to run races, and when you run races, you get currency. So we have to, and the amount of currency that you get per race um, increases based on each race that you uh, complete. So basically, what we have done is we have created an equivalence that it has three scenarios: one for early game, mid game, and late game, and we will roll with that. But if your game keeps inflation under control, maybe you can just have one, a single scenario, which would make the system much easier to manage. So your question up to this point is, is this, isn't this a control model? Isn't this the kind of, okay, I invest this time, I get this amount of money and so on. 
Short answer, yes, sort of. Uh, long answer, no, it's just the very basic so that you can estimate the actual cost of prices. And actually, at one point in the process, you will want to buy, to build a control model. And this could be a foundational part of that control model, but it's not the control model. Here, what we want is something quick in order to be able to relate um, real, time, real, time, uh, real world money to game currency and time. Now, the third step is going to be structuring items by value. Now, the first question would be, okay, say the first step on that structuring is to rank them from uh, less valuable to more valuable. But there are different definitions of what's value on a game. Now, the most basic one would be uh, power. So basically, the lowest stuff is the stuff that has the lowest performance in the game. And the best performance is the stuff that is the most expensive. Now, like in this example, where we have ranked the different cars of the game based on the best time that they can achieve on a race. But what happens with games such as Brawl Stars, where each of the units uh, have more or less the same competitive, um, competitive performance? So in Brawl Stars, you cannot necessarily say that one character is better than another. It's maybe better in some situation. And even the, uh, the characters that you get at the beginning, which sure are easier to, to uh, control, they still can be very good performance, uh, they still can have very good performance in uh, certain levels of the game. Well, what you can do there is just rank them by scarcity. Um, all of the units in Brawl Stars may have the same performance overall, uh, but not, not all of them have the same chances to appear when you open loot boxes. So scarcity um, it's also a way how you can generate uh, different uh, layers of value and therefore can allow you to rank. And if everything else fails and your game is, for example, um, or you're, you're ranking up items that are cosmetics, uh, what you can do is just rank them based on how cool do they look, which is what they do, for example, in games like Fortnite, where the items do not uh, give you an advantage in the game. They just make you look cooler. So the cooler items are more expensive. Now, one thing that I cannot stress enough is that ranking items of the same kind is not enough. Structure is the key element for pricing. Now, imagine we have this situation, right? We have ranked all our cars, but it makes sense to price them just like this. Just go for, okay, the worst car is cheap, the best car is super expensive, and that's it. Well, not really. It wouldn't make sense. Why? Well, first, we would be uh, missing the optimal price for each spending profile. At one point of the game, as we release cars that are more and more expensive, they would go away from the uh, budget of Mr. Subaru. And if we keep on going for that, they would even go away from the uh, Mr. Porsche that spends a lot of money. The second thing is that it would exclude users that can't keep up, right? At one point, uh, when the prices scale up to a point that are not manageable, are not um, manageable within the budget of um, Mr. Subaru, then he will quit the game because he cannot keep up, keep on playing. And the last thing is that, well, they're not scalable. Like uh, they present a very bad um, conception of the future, a promise of how the future of the game will be, because the game will become more and more expensive in the future. The amount of people that we can will be able to afford uh, keep on playing on the game will be smaller and smaller. So that's not very good. Now, how do successful free-to-play games solve these problems? There are several strategies. One would be create a strict progression system where every step of the way, or most of the steps of the way, require you to complete the previous levels. If you do that, then you can make that each new step, uh, it's gonna have the, um, or can have the same exact price. Uh, you don't necessarily have to increase it. You pay $9.99 and the next payment is gonna be $9.99. That's the way how you can do it. Another is to plan obsolescence. Um, this, uh, happens with games that introduce new content. They basically, you replace the old content. Um, and as you replace the usability of that new content, as the 
previous car stops being the best car in the game and you introduce a new one, then you drop the price. And as you drop the price, other audiences are able to purchase that item. That, for example, is what happens with games like uh, Magic the Gathering. As new sets of cards are being introduced, the previous sets uh, become less and less expensive. And then once per year, uh, the very old content gets deprecated. You cannot use it anymore on standard mode. And that, at that point, uh, it basically loses all its value when it comes to uh, the competitive um, element of the game. Another uh, strategy that you can use is price fragmentation is what we saw that CSR was doing in comparison to Real Racing 3. Uh, instead of requesting a super high upfront price for the item, what you can do is request a smaller price and then add more depth of spending later on. So um, imagine this case where we have a car that it's 99 uh, or $100, uh, it's clearly out of range of one of four um, customer personas, but if we priced the item at a smaller price and then we added so many upgrades, uh, which there are like small bytes, small payments of uh, 10 bucks, but there are a lot of them, uh, at each step of the way, uh, the item is um, affordable for all of our audiences. A couple of rules of thumbs when it comes to um, structuring items. The first is, okay, amount of free content. We already anticipated this at the beginning of the uh, session. We said that a significant percentage of the game content should be achievable without pain. And you need to make sure that players should always have um, meaningful objectives close enough to be worth playing for and keep on playing without paying at every step of the way. The second is you need to take into account uh, the user journey uh, and uh, the decisions. You want to create meaningful decisions. Uh, for example, what you can do is, okay, we have this series of cars where we could generate these situations where I make you choose between two cars and one of them is premium. This will not only create expression for the player so that he can uh, choose what is the car that represents more value for, for um, the player, but also it can create this kind of free versus premium moments. And by comparison, of course, you will make uh, players pay because they, they want the premium content, which is gonna be superior. And another important thing is that even if you want to maximize the amount of value that you make from your premium content, you should never forget to add conversion prices. Conversion prices are small prices uh, targeting uh, or their aim is to make players make their first purchase. So you want to have those 0 0.99, 1.99, just so that players are able to pay once, um, then keep on playing the game longer and then increase the amount of money that uh, they spend in the game later on. Now, the final step of this um, methodology is going to be just assign the prices based on everything we have seen so far. If you have followed those steps, by this point, you should have a set of assumptions about your payers. So how much do they play? How much time do they spend on the game? How much money do they spend on the game? What's their budget and so on? You also have a road weight on how to translate prices uh, to equivalences in game currency and time. So you can estimate um, the effort that you're requesting, which if of the, each of the prices that you are uh, setting up. And then you have a structure of game content, uh, which will guarantee that your uh, game has um, not a price that increases forever and has enough, in enough incentives for um, non-paying users to keep on playing. So you should be able to assign the different prices based on, on the time objectives that you have, the amounts of money that are reasonable for your players and, and everything else. Now, what you will have at that point will not be a complete setup of the, of the prices or the final setup. What you will have is a set of numbers on a paper. And this is just the first step. I mean, stuff that makes sense on paper may not make sense uh, from the player perspective. So, of course, what you have with, with this is a first draft or your, of your um, pricing model. 
which then you would have to play test, you would have to uh, confirm with reality, you would have to play test over and over and make sure that um, it makes sense. Before we finish, I have a series of uh, final tips. The first is copy, then understand, then improve. If you don't know exactly what you're doing, if you're not very sure about your pricing strategy, if you're entering the new genre um, or a new audience, do not try to innovate at the beginning. At the beginning, look at what others are doing, uh, copy their model, then understand why it works, and then later on innovate. The second is do not let your assumptions remain as assumptions. There's a series of tools that you can use in order to test if those assumptions are true and even improve them. Uh, you can A-B test, you can release uh, different versions of the game with different sets of prices, see what works the best. You can release similar items at different, at different price points and try to figure what is the price elasticity of that item. The other is try to cover all price ranges, as we said, even if the, ultima the optimal price point of your game is a certain uh, point, you still want to have lower prices in order to attract different audiences and in order to make them convert and become a higher um, um, spending users later. Then at behavioral economic pricing strategies, you can find about that on the internet, about uh, anchoring prices, decoys, and stuff like that, which will give you um, a little bit of an edge in order to make your pricing strategies more effective. The next is going to be apply common sense. Just play test heavily, keep in touch with your players, and make, sense, uh, make, make sure that what you're putting there is not just numbers on the paper, but it's the stuff that makes sense for the players, which, is, which are the ones that are going to be uh, that are going to judge and they're going to pay for the stuff of your game. Uh, that's it. That has been the presentation. It's been a high-level view of uh, pricing. Uh, if it's not been able to give you the answer, at least hopefully it has been able to guide you where uh, they are. Thank you for following us.